All right. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Joined here on the Fuse Live show with our guest, Patrick Burns of Commons.so. Our topic for today is recreating water cooler talk for the remote office. And our tagline is exploring why it's important, more important than ever, to stay connected to your team via real-time conversation. Uh, a bit about Patrick. Patrick is the co-founder of Commons.so, which is a venture-backed startup building, <laughs> a venture-backed startup that's building the future of enterprise audio. Their product enables remote teams to talk as if they were in the same room and in the process, break down barriers that inhibit communication and connection. Patrick and his co-founders came together in May of 2020 when they realized the way we work was changing before their eyes, uh, certainly thanks to, to COVID. Seemingly overnight, remote work became the new normal for millions around the world, yet there weren't collaborative tools made for this paradigm, and it felt like we were still in the cubicle era. era. To solve this problem, Commons enables teams to have interactions you'd have in, in the physical office without needing to step foot in it. Starting with the drop-in conversations, uh, together, the Commons team has 40 plus years of engineering and product experience and has developed products at Snap, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and their own startups. So Patrick, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk. Awesome. All right, enough of that reading business. Let's get into the actual conversation, which is much more fun than, than reading. Um, so tell me it. about about Commons. Let's uh, let's start with an overview of, of what Commons is, what it does, and, and the, the mission that you guys have. Sure. I'll start with a mission. Uh, our mission as a company is to make work feel more connected. This is something that we feel can have a transformational impact, not just on individuals, but entire organizations. Um, we believe that when work is truly connected, when you feel a sense of connection to your teammates, to your company's mission, to the work you do, you will do better work. Um, so that's that's our mission. Now, the way that we get there is, at least our first step, is making it making the most efficient way to talk to your team. Uh, we believe that that is not only missing in today's distributed, hybrid distributed work environment, uh, but it's also necessary to have a truly connected workplace. And I can go into more detail there, but that's what it is at a high level. Yeah. So is it is it a way to, I guess, create a remote version of those serendipitous conversations? Like I just went here in my office to get a cup of coffee and had a nice little exchange with with a, a person over at the the coffee pot. Right? Is that the idea? That's 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 the basic premise. Um, so it goes much deeper and there are, we now know there's very specific use cases within this umbrella of serendipitous conversations. Um, but in general, it's that some people refer to us as the clubhouse for your team okay. or discord for your, for your company or for your team. Both of those are, um, for those of those who don't know, or audio based live audio based um, applications for consumer um, or gaming uh, use cases predominantly. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're taking a, a, a fairly similar product approach, uh, but focused on teams who are working in a distributed environment. Um, I see. So yeah. what percentage of the product would you say is, is intended for sort of professional collaboration versus the, the personal connection side? And I, I think a lot of, Maybe it's just my perspective, but I feel like a lot of founders kind of undervalue the relationship side, that personal connection, um, yeah. especially when you're playing the long game, right? Those those relationships, that sense of belonging is all really important. A hundred thousand percent. And, you know, it's interesting that you say that because one of the many mistakes that we made early on in, uh, we were, we're now almost a year into starting this company. Um, and um, And one of the mistakes that we made early on was Thinking about this question you just asked, you know, do we focus on the collaborative productivity oriented use cases, or do we focus exclusively on the social sort of culture, um, sort of uh, connection oriented use cases? Yeah. Um, and what we now know after learning the hard way is in the work environment, uh, these two things exist on a fluid spectrum. And so, yeah. for instance, when you jump into the office, which no one does these days, but back when you did go to the office and you wa walked in 
the first thing in the morning, you say, hey, team, morning. How is, uh, how's your morning going? Okay, cool. How's that project coming? So in one sentence yeah. or one conversation, you talk about personal things and you talk about productivity oriented things. That's how work gets done. Yeah. Um, our broader thesis on this is that, you know, you need both of those. You, you need any could because at the end of the day, teams are individuals who are connecting and collaborating. And if you don't have that sense of connection, if you don't know who that person mm-hmm. is, it's very hard to, to sort of see them on the same level. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I'm curious. I, I want to ask you a question about adoption of the product, but it just, my, my first thought on that was like, oh, well, this is going to potentially compete with the likes of Slack, Zoom, et cetera. So I know that there's among founders, a sense of fatigue. Uh, we, I guess we can call it like tool fatigue. Yeah. So that's, that's one part of the coin. But the other side is what about adoption as it relates to the general ethos? Like I know some founders have an idea of like, I don't know that I want my people just chatting it up all day, talking about, you know, the weather, the baseball game or whatever. It's not productive. Um, I'm on the side of like, no, I, I think the human connection, personal relationships I, uh, aspect is incredibly productive and important. But, but, what, but what about adoption and sort of pushback from founders in that, in that regard? It's a good question. And that's why, you know, ultimately we position our product as a productivity tool first, because we know we've we've now done a lot of case studies and, and different surveys with our customers. Teams who are using commons, they report that they're moving faster, sometimes by an order of like 30%. Maybe it means like 30% less meetings because I can get the answer in two minutes versus a half an hour. Yeah. Um, there is like people can act upon different inspiration in the moment without having to write something on a list and wait for the monthly brainstorm. Um, and so we actually think that what we're solving is at its core, a productivity problem. Um, in this, and to relate to your second part of your question, we think about this and, and sort of the other tools that exist. Uh, there is no way currently for a distributed team to have what you might call a tap on the shoulder conversation in less than, less than five actions. So if, if I, I want to do that on Zoom, I have to find the people I want to talk to, find a time, uh, send them a note of some kind, Slack or email, yeah. confirm they can join, set up the meeting. So it's literally like a 15, 20 step process and it yeah. takes 15, 20 minutes to set up. Well, if, if I want to ask a question that's two, literally two minutes long, I just need to confirm one or two things because I'm, I have a deadline or like I have a customer who's on the other line. I just need one or two things to confirm with maybe one other person or people. I, it's, there's no way to do that. And so ultimately yeah. commons, that is the primary, like the core acute need is that sort of tap on the shoulder, less than typically less than five minute in, interaction conversation that we know that type that talking is roughly seven to ten times faster than talking, especially when you're when you're talking about you know a lot of complex things. And so we actually see that you know not only are you feeling more connected, but you're actually moving faster. That you're able to collaborate more efficiently. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. It, it reminds me. I so w- when I provide support now and in the past, I love using a tool called Loom. Uh, which I'm sure yep, you're yep. most of the audience are familiar with. And it's yep. effectively like the video version of what you're talking about, but it's yep. so efficient. And what's, what's amazing is that it blows customers away uh, because they, they spell it, feel like they're getting, you know, special treatment, but it's way faster for us to do that. Uh, you know, and I, I think that I maybe overuse, <laughs> I make a lot of looms. I think I probably wear my team so out I. with them, but, so <laughs> I. but it's good though. Like, I, I mean, and I, I feel like the audio version of that is just much more efficient even still. Yeah, I mean, it, I completely agree. I love Loom. I think it's an amazing product. I think I just, I think I just uh, popped a uh, button. Um, it's an amazing product, and and you're right. It's getting real you know, in it's here. Interesting. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> it's our, our broader belief on this. Um, if you zoom out way way into the macro level, mm-hmm. um, this you know this this uh, the way of working um, that was catalyzed by this immediate shift post COVID. Yeah. It, 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 it progressed a lot of um, technologies and use cases five years or maybe 10 years in a compressed amount of time. And so mm-hmm. our belief is that tools like Commons and Loom and 
all these other tools that are either fairly new or just starting are going to be needed more and more and more because people are spending more time in digital spaces, whether for work or for play. Um, and you know, a lot of the tools that we're using right now that are standard, you know, Slack was started seven years ago. Zoom was started seven or 10 years ago, somewhere around there. And so there's going to be new tools needed for new use cases. Sure. And these tools, these tools need to be purpose built, which is like you mentioned, Loom is a, is a very specific, mm -hmm. uh, product, but it, but it does that yeah. one thing exceptionally well. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So let's shift gears a little bit here. We're, we're both amateur psychologists. So let, let's, let's nerd out a little bit on, on the psychology of work. I, yeah. and I know people, people have differing opinions of this. Like I, I appreciate the opportunity to have zoom because it's better than a phone conversation. It's better than, than nothing. It's better than a chat conversation, but I'm kind of tired of it too. It's like, I, th there was a guy that pitched me on LinkedIn and he's like a C-suite level consultant and he's in the Denver area. And he's like, Hey, how about a quick zoom call? I'm like, how about coffee in person Friday? You know, like I've been vaccinated. Yeah. Let's do this. Um, I just yeah. want, I just want that. So what are your thoughts on, it's like, a, it's like, it's been a trial by fire over this last year. And I think we don't really even know what the long-term consequences are, but what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we hear it every day. I mean, um, we, we don't use Zoom except for, I, we think of Zoom as the metaphorical equivalent of the super high-end conference room that every office has, maybe on the on the top floor of, of the office with, you know, big windows and I see. long 50 person. It's a super professional place for formal meetings. Um, so for pitches, all hands, uh, uh, you know, client, uh sales calls it's great now do you want to spend your entire day every day in that super duper high-end conference room no it's like it's kind of Taxi. cold you know yeah. yeah it's the air is stale um so that we think of you know there's obviously tons of science behind why people are tired of zoom a lot of it's like staring at yourself and then a grid of screens for 12 hours <laughs> yeah. a day is just is does does not good things for your brain yeah so um so, so there's there's obviously a lot of pushback um, because for obvious reasons. Now, the, going back to 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 why we have, uh, you know, Commons as audio first. Uh, we do we do let you turn on your camera, but it's audio first. So audio is the primary mm -hmm. format, and the reason is, you know, we really think that just as Clubhouse has showed for consumer use cases, there's something about live audio that can at times be it can be more, I don't want to say intimate, but you can kind of hear in voices, sometimes different information you can hear from looking at somebody and seeing their voice. And in the work context, it also enables you, if you have a social convention in your office around audio as, as like the primary format, um, then it lets you do things like talk and you know look at a screen together or talk and like work on something while you're talking. Um, mm -hmm. All these different use cases that, again, when you're in the office, there's sometimes when you're sitting at your desk and you're talking to somebody, but that person is over there, she's not actually looking at that person. You're, you're talking while you're, and so anyway, we, we think that that live audio and, 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 and you know the type of audio that people have on comments is actually perfect for this time um, you know, for, for a lot of these reasons. Yeah. Okay, so what about the the adoption issue thanks to tool fatigue? Are you are you mm -hmm. getting pushback on that? And if so, how are you combating that? Well, it's a good question. I mean, I think, I think in general, anytime there's a new way of doing something, yeah, there's always going to be, especially when it's a team oriented product yeah. like ours, um, there's always going to be a challenge around convincing. Behavior change is extremely challenging for individuals. And then, yeah. you know, of course, a, tie, a team is just like that times harder. Um, <laughs> however, I do believe, just as we were talking about with Zoom fatigue, that people are, they're struggling. Like the, there have been, a lot of people have been sitting at home for over 12 months now, um, getting lost every day in Slack threads, spending the entire day on Zoom. They really are struggling for something new, something different, some better way, in our case, of communicating that yeah. feels more natural that doesn't doesn't involve just like just you know you look at a slack thread sometimes and you're and there's just like so many and you're like oh my god how am i going to catch up i'm 
I, I turn yeah. turn my head and turn back, and all of a sudden there's like 45 notifications. And it's like, yeah. ah, can we just like talk through this? Um, yeah. So, so that's the way we think about it. Okay, that makes sense. So you guys are roughly a year in. What what is your current most significant pain point at Commons? Um, I mean, the early stage startup, like the house is always on fire. It just depends, <laughs> like what house, you know. Yeah. Like, uh, um, I think. You know, we're at the point now where we have a very solid foundation on the product. Um, now it's about accelerating. How do we accelerate this progress that we've made? And yeah. and that's that that comes back to the team. How, who who are going to be the next round of of hires that we make, and how do we find yeah. the right individuals uh, for those yeah. key hires? Um, so that's yeah. um, that, and that's just you know, recruiting is like a something I, that I realize has to be like a 20 to 30% uh, effort for early stage founders. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So while we're still on the topic, we have a, a guest question or a viewer question rather. And um, he says, is it fair to loosely say that Commons is a gamification of the real office experience? That's really interesting. I never thought about that uh, phrase mm -hmm. that way. I don't know. I don't know if I would say gamification. What we do I'd say what where I would agree is that um, what we're trying to build with Commons is a product that feels like you're talking in the same room with your teammates, um, and what that means is you know speed is important. When you're in the same room, you don't have to like wait to to say something to somebody. You just turn around and say something to somebody. Um, yeah. You don't have to. Uh, you know, people, you also know if someone's like heads down on something or if someone's not at their desk, that's a visual cue. Those are both visual cues. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about how we can translate those visual cues into the product. Um, simple things like, you know, when we have your, we have a calendar integration, so we know when you're busy, um, but it goes much deeper than that. Um, and so, but yeah, in general, we're, we're trying to recreate the feeling of being in the same room with your teammates. Okay, great. I, I want to dive a little bit, Patrick, into your background. You have quite a quite a resume. So time at, at Google, Snapchat, and Amazon as product manager. And I, I want to highlight, I love this, what you and I were talking yesterday about the film you produced, which is called Cutie and the Boxer, um, Oscar-nominated documentary film back in, well, you said, you, you told me yesterday it was about a five-year project, right? In 08 to like yeah. 15. Right. So, so tell me, tell me about that. I want to, I want to bridge the gap between that experience and then jumping into the business world. Um, and then, and then also, and it's, I'm maybe getting ahead of myself, but how you apply the experience that you gained in kind of a non-business context, like filmmaking to what you do now. Yep. Yep. Uh, man, <laughs> I can go on, I can go on for a while about this. So I'll try to try to keep it Keep it brief. Um, the, uh, the the high level story is, so before I got into the tech industry about 10 years ago, I worked in media. It was my first career, I guess you could say. Um, not much of a career, because I only did it for, for a few years, because um, I realized I just, it wasn't my passion. Um, but this film project was one of these things that um, it was a weekend project that over the course of several years, and in total five years, it became a much bigger and bigger and bigger project. And it started very small. And so the way I think about it is, it was almost directly analogous to starting a company. Myself hmm, okay. and my best my best best friends, the so two people, we have this big vision. We met these 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 two the 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 protagonists of the movie, these two artists who are this older Japanese couple, and we met them. We're like, oh, there's a story here. There's definitely a story here, but we don't know what it is. But there's definitely a story. It's a big vision, but a lot of ambiguity. And we every almost every weekend for almost five, probably closer to three or four years, we were filming. And slowly but surely, the more that we filmed, the more the story came to evolve. And so I think about this ex part of your question. Like, I come it's in 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 some cases, I turn I I came away from the project. And I'm like, huh, like. How am I going to translate that? That has nothing to do with the business world. But then I'm like, actually, it's kind of just like any other project. Like you have a vision, 
There's a lot of work. There's a lot of changing and trying and iteration and experimentation. There's a lot of feedback gathering. There's a lot of, in the case of a documentary film, there's a lot of like, you know, the way that you ask questions is really yeah. important. Same thing with early customer development. The way you ask questions is very important. There's right and wrong ways. Um, I'm a very visual person. I have a photography. The reason I got into the film is I have a photography background. So I still do a lot of photography. Okay. And so I think, you know, uh, that comes in, I'm not a, design, uh, a UI designer myself, but it, it, you know, that visual orientation is, um, I'd say very important for anybody building consumer or even enterprise products. Um, so it comes into play as well. Um, so, um, and I see the final thing about it, the, the, the sort of learning, um, that is applicable to the business world is that, um, when we started that project, we said myself and, uh, my friend Zach, we said, oh, you know, let's spend six months and see where it goes. And um, six months turned into 12 months, turned into 18 months, turned into two years, turned into three, then four, then five. And at the end of it, we're like, yeah, there's no way this could have been made in less than five years. And so I've internalized that to think about things on a longer term horizon when possible. And instead of thinking about that. things in terms of a one-year horizon, think about things on a five-year horizon. What can you do in five years? Um, and so going back to commons, we have a 15-year vision for what we want to do. And and we're taking it five-year chunks at a time. So we're, we're still very much in, in the Amazon parlance. We're in day one of that first five years. I love that you brought that up. I want to use that as a, a natural segue to talk about playing the long game. I feel like that a lot of the times just in life when we're disappointed, it's as a result of unmet expectations. And mm -hmm. that makes me ask, ask the question, it's like, well, were the expectations realistic to begin with? And I think we hear mm. as founders, all these stories of, you know, quote, overnight successes that, yeah. and there's a story, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher this, but there's a story of a, I wish I could, could attribute this to whoever, whoever came up with it, but a story of a, like a mechanic that went out to a, a rural area to fix a car and he fixed it in, you know, 15 seconds or whatever. And he said, that'll be $10,000. And they're like, that's ridiculous. It took you 15 seconds. He's like, no, it took me 30 years how to figure out how to fix this in 15 seconds. Like there's yeah. value in the long game. Um, I'm, I'm curious, like what your thoughts on that and how you manage expectations in the short term and sort of remind yourself that you're playing that long game. Oh man. Uh, another, another, this is an incredible question. Uh, this, this is something I could spend a week talking about or thinking about. I we think can just it's, take, it's take all... breaks every few hours, man. We'll just keep <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, I, I don't know if our viewers would, would enjoy that. No, um, take some breaks too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, some, it's almost like, uh, I think about it. It's a, it's, it's almost a skill set that, um, in, in my you know previous roles as a product manager, when I interviewed people, it was there was always I always tried to test uh, the individual's ability to see the the big picture, the long game, as well as the pixel level detail, because I think you need that constant um, aperture range, if you will, um, and because it's so easy, as you know, to just focus on the immediate like day's priorities right in front of you. And what you what happens if you do that for too long is you you lose sight and you start veering off and changing direction only when you pick your head up. So yeah. there's a couple of things, you know, uh, we try to do these like once a month, once every two months kind of strategic regroup. You know, are we actually on the right path? Did we do we veer what do we make mistakes? Um, and that in, that in, that requires sometimes taking a day or two to just like put pencils down and like you know think about where where, where we've gone and where we're going. I think it's so essential. So based on that that methodology, then do you set? And I, I you know, David and I, David's my my co-founder, and we do a lot of things that I don't I don't know you know what the the most common thing is among founders, but we're very careful not to set specific goals that we don't necessarily have control over. It's like, we don't say we want to be at X revenue next month, but like yeah. what, what we do is show up and, and work our hardest on the things we think are the most important to move the ball forward. But we try yeah. to mitigate against disappointment by not setting real specific goals for which we don't have control over. 
So is that yeah. is that roughly the way you think, or do you have a different way of looking at that? That's a that's a it's a good it's a good it's a good. Um, I've de we definitely have done that because you're totally right. Sometimes um, the goals that you set in Q1 don't matter in Q3. Maybe the numbers don't. Maybe the metrics don't matter. So I think mm -hmm. that it requires some flexibility. Um, but I also think that even the process of figuring out if we were to set goals, what would those goals be? Um, so at Amazon, there's this, there's this, um, the way that they think about this is before any project, there's like a six pager plan that okay. you have to write. Typically the product person has to write it. And it basically lays out that like long-term vision and then like step one, two, three. And, okay. and I, and I think the reason they do this there, it, it, it's a very vigorous, um, it's a very rigorous process. I don't know if I would say it's more rigorous than vigorous. Um, but the point is, the point is, it, it forces you to think about that long term, even if you, even if that long term will likely change. Uh, there's a there's a quote here I'm missing, but it's something about like, if you don't have a plan, then the plan will make you or something. I'm I'm totally butchering it. But uh, the point is, I think it's a good exercise to knowing that things will change in the medium to long term. It's still good to kind of at least know where your North Star is. So on that note then, when it comes to business partners, you and I both have business partners, how are you and your your partners with alignment on this? And I don't, and by the way, I love the idea of partners complimenting each other, just like in a good marriage, right? Like if, if you're married right. to someone that's exactly like you, that's just bad news, you know? Right. Um, we already spend 24 hours a day with ourselves. We don't need a times two that, but, um, so I think some differences are certainly important, but yet in the big picture on the, the main ways of thinking, I think it's, it's really important to, to be aligned. So do you find that that's the case with your, your partnerships? At a thousand percent, a thousand percent. And we've been so lucky. I've been so lucky. So I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't introduce them. Uh, they're obviously not here, sure. but, um, Aziz and Nazan are my two co-founders. Um, they are both full stack engineers. They both have about 15 years of experience. Uh, they both worked at Microsoft for over 10 years. Um, and they've also, I met Aziz at Snapchat. So that's how we, okay. that's how we, that's how we met. Um, and so they are not only world-class full stack developers, they can build anything, but they also have that sort of founder mentality. They, they, they know how to be scrappy and make decisions quickly. Uh, so that sort of combination of skills is extremely rare. Um, and so I feel extremely lucky. The other thing that I feel lucky about is that um, it, our mission as a company is very much internalized into us as people. Uh, mm -hmm. So Nazan, she worked from home for the, for I guess three or so years in the last few years of her time at Microsoft. And this is obviously before COVID. Um, and she, I think, internalized a lot of the challenges of the remote work environment from an, from an employee's perspective. And so for her, this mission is extremely resonant. The same thing is true for me and Aziz. Uh, we actually met, we worked at Snap, worked on the same team. He was engineering lead for stories. I was product lead for stories. And we worked together but we actually built a relationship, built a bond because of a conversation we had outside of work. We talked about music and he's from Turkey and I love Turkish music. Uh, or I love this one band and we're, we made this connection. And thinking back a year ago, we, we, we were like, if we had been working remotely, that conversation would not have happened. Um, we would not have been, we, not, we would not have been able to forge this friendship. Yeah. And so that was a current, so we're like, oh, that's so interesting. Like that's, you know, that's a shame. You spend a lot of time with people that you work with. Uh, there should be ways for you to develop a stronger bond with them. And that was a, very much a kernel of inspiration for comments. Yeah. All right, I got to pause you for a second, Patrick. So are you just browsing Amazon music and you come across Turkish music? And you're like, this is just awesome. Or do you have some connection to, to Turkey? I, uh, no formal connection. I mean, now I, now I obviously, uh, no, with the season is on, uh, they're from Turkey. Um, I'm kind of a uh, voracious mu uh, music listener. Uh, okay. So I, I play music. I, uh, I, I DJ. I used to DJ before you know people stopped going to uh, parties. Um, but 
I listen to a lot of crazy music and um, I happened to become obsessed with this one Turkish band. Um, so it was it's kind of funny. It, the, the band is, uh, the, the band is called Zelda. Uh, it's a woman's name. And you could think okay. of her as like the Janis Joplin or like Joni Mitchell kind of figure for Turkey. Maybe, okay. maybe I, I might be yeah. wrong here. Please forgive me. <laughs> Um, so do you, do you listen while you work to music? Yeah, 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 tons. I mean, um, depends. It depends on the day or the, or the time of day. But yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're, we so are. Far we're, as... up, we are back to comments. We, you know, one yeah, yeah. thing we hear. Um, you know, when you're in the when you're in the office, you sometimes like you know, someone who's in charge of the radio. You know, and so part of having the shared experiences with your teammates sometimes involves music. And so we're actually sure. working on integration with Spotify so that you can listen to music with your team while you're working. Yeah. So what about having my colleagues just like sing into my ear while they're working? <laughs> but, <laughs> I guess it depends on, uh, uh, you know, maybe, maybe your colleagues have a great voice. If so, uh, I don't know. I need to find out. It's good for you. <laughs> I, I would never do that personally, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not a key to productivity. It's not good. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, it depends. I mean, <laughs> so how do you and uh, Aziz and and Nizan handle conflict? Like, inevitably, that comes up, right? Like, how yeah. do you process through that? Yeah, it's good. You know, again, something from Amazon. Uh, one of their like leadership principles that they kind of hammer into your brain is um, disagree and commit. Uh, and so we very much embody that spirit at, at Commons. We believe that conflict, especially when it's like task-oriented conflict, especially when it comes to figuring out which decision to make on, on a product decision, um, that's good. It's actually good. Like the, you, mm -hmm. need, you need a lot of you know, strong opinions. Um, and, and so we welcome I wouldn't say we welcome conflict. We we welcome um, very um, um, you know impassioned uh, debate about okay. yeah. the right thing because it, it 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 means that we feel very strongly and there might be one or two or three or, or more ways of doing something that we should definitely mm -hmm. understand why um, and so we have, we like it. Uh, we think it's actually part of it's a it's a healthy part of of uh, product development, and um, but the one thing we don't do is we don't have any sort of relationship conflict because that is something I learned in business school. Which you know, task based conflict is great, it's good if you but relationship based conflict is not good. So you don't want to be like you know in this territory, but yeah, strong strong teams should be able to be very direct. I don't agree with you. Here's why, uh, mm -hmm. and not. You know, it's obviously hard to do that, but you know, it's absolutely essential for for small founding teams like ours. That's great. Yeah, that's a really a really good distinction, actually, on the personal versus yeah. professional side. And Let's I, use that as I, a I, I just one. Oh, go ahead, Patrick. I, I saw that take place at. I worked at Google and Amazon, and they have almost polar opposite approaches to this. Uh, hmm. At Amazon, people are you're are you you expect people to poke holes in your ideas. That's just part of the culture. And so you can't ever like take it personally. You actually just learn to, that's part of the process. At Google, there's not that culture. And so at Google, um, there's this consensus oriented culture. And um, if I did choose one for an early stage startup, I, I definitely think the Amazon model will likely lead to better decision making um, because sometimes the counterintuitive thing that someone understands before everyone else does is the right thing. It takes a mature person to receive that well. Very mature, yeah. yeah. And, you, and you gotta have a very strong foundation of trust, uh, which obviously we have, and I think every founding team absolutely needs. You're climbing a mountain yeah. together. You're gonna, yeah. you're, you're gonna come across blizzards and snowstorms and you're gonna lose everything and have to rebuild the fort. I mean, every single bad thing is gonna happen. Um, so if you don't trust each other, then it's, it's gonna be a very long journey. Yeah. 
So let's, you, you brought up business school and you and I were talking offline about your time at Wharton. Uh, you have your MBA from there. I mentioned to you that I, I have some hours towards my MBA and I stopped when I was taking a class on online marketing and what I was learning by a teacher who had never actually done online marketing was archaic. And then I was trying to apply this and I was, I was concurrently learning on, you know, YouTube. And what I was learning there was, was, um, I guess the current version of, of what, you know, what, what was considered best practice at the time. And so I thought, you know, I'm just like, this isn't really helpful to me. And, and so I left that, uh, I left that, that, that program, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. If you would recommend to founders that are, you know, earlier in their career, younger, uh, if it's a wise choice to to go to business school, it's a it's a really loaded question. Um, I'm glad mm, you're yep, asking it. There you go. I have uh, I hope no one from Wharton or any higher education um, organization <laughs> is listening. I'm pretty skeptical on um, the current model of higher education in general, uh, in in its ability to serve the needs of of you know the population for various reasons. Now. Um, putting that aside, for the for the MBA in particular, to answer your question, it really is a personal decision, and it and it really, it comes down to several different factors. I mean, ultimately, the way I think about it is, in my case, before the MBA, I didn't have any formal business experience. I had very for, I had almost zero formal business understanding. I'd never taken finance, accounting, any of that stuff, um, yeah. data analytics. All I didn't. I also didn't have a network. Um, anywhere near my current network. I, I knew very few people in the business world. And so for me, there were, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew where I wanted to go. And there were these two big gaps. And I'm like, okay, cool. I can, you know, the MBA can actually fill those gaps. And so it really was is incredibly, incredibly beneficial for me. I don't think it's, I don't think it would uh, be the uh, best choice for everybody. Um, it just really depends. The other thing, the other factor to keep in mind, like you said, there's, you can learn so much online today and you can meet people yeah. online. And um, I, I guess lecture every semester at USC. And so I, I meet a lot of undergrads there and they learn everything on YouTube, everything. And and they can, and it's all, I almost, it's almost scary sometimes. I'm like, yeah. these these kids are 18 and, and, they, and they already have better skills than I do. I'm, I'm gonna be obsolete in like two weeks. Like, um, they can like code, they can design, they know like business models and like, well, go start a business. Like don't, don't, yeah. don't spend any more time in college. Like, you know how to do this stuff. Just go. Um, so I think it makes you think though, like, like knowing how to do it and then knowing what to do and when to do it, like that's the application of wisdom. And I would argue the, the thing that they don't yet have. Right. Of course, of course, of course. And that takes time. It takes a lot of time. And, um, but I think the future is very bright, uh, when it comes to alternative models, even something like Lambda School, uh, which I'm a uh -huh. I'm a mentor for them. Um, okay. Uh, my my mentee, she a year ago, she had never taken a computer science class, um, was working in retail, wanted to change careers. A year later, she's already making over two times the amount that she was making previously. She's working as an engineer, and it's remarkable. Like that, all of that yeah. in less than twelve months. So I think it's really really yeah. amazing what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Let's shift to, and I literally just thought of this topic. I think it's an interesting one to explore. And that is the the role of humility mm. amongst founders. And what comes yeah. to mind is I was listening to David Hauser speak at the LTV conference back in, let's see, uh, spring of 19. And he he sold Grasshopper for millions and millions of dollars. Was it 60 million or some obscene amount? A lot of money. And he said that, you know, here's what we did to be successful. And he explained all of that. And then he, he laid down this caveat. He said, but you, you can't just take this. You know, it's like using somebody's winning lottery ticket numbers. It's like, well, that's great for them, but it doesn't work for you. And the principle of what he was sharing was like, we need to have a culture of experimentation. And, and I think the deeper part of that is just humility, the, the ability and willingness to say, I, I don't know. Like, we're just trying to figure this out like the next guy. And I don't, I don't know, you know? So what, what are your thoughts on, on that in terms of, you know, running yeah. comedy? I, I got to say, uh, this is one of the bigger lessons that um, I learned, and I'm sure Nazan and uh, Aziz would mostly agree. Um, although they they they, uh, they they may have learned this in their previous company as well. But when you work at big established companies like Google and Snap, um, I guess not that big, but you know established companies, mm -hmm. 
you're not really solving zero to one. You're solving one to n or n to more n type of problems. Mm -hmm. And so you have this foundation of, of users and product. Um, but when you when you found something, you're doing zero to one, and you're doing it on a shoestring budget typically. And so uh, when I was at Snap, we got so used to like every product that you ship has to be pixel perfect. Everything has to be perfect before it touches any user's hands. Um, in the startup world, you can't wait that long. You have to ship early and often. You have to yeah. ship things that are embarrassing looking. And that's really hard to get over, extremely yeah. hard at first. But then you realize that like, hey, like you were saying, this is this is just an iterative process. Like, and you know, you have to reduce the, the cycles between uh, sort of launch and learn, launch, learn, launch, learn. Iterations have to be really, really tight. Um, so that, that's the way I think about it. And I also think back to the whole point of humility, you know, we don't know the answer. Um, we are, mm -hmm. you know, the, the beauty of, of having a very customer focused approach like we do is, again, this is like kind of a Amazonism. Um, customers always want more. They always want more. And so uh, if you really, really know how to listen to them, they will lead you to places that they actually want to go. Uh, and what mm -hmm. you realize is that you often don't know what, what the, they, maybe you kind of hear some echoes and you can, you can sort of make the triangle and go there. But it really involves kind of understanding that, like, hey, they're pulling us along, essentially. Yeah. I think it's also so important from a leadership perspective, too. And that's that's hard, you know, when you're I, there's a lot of weight on the shoulders of founders to be successful for, for the sake of the, the, the team, the product, the clients. I and mean, there's just a lot of weight of responsibility. And I think it can be difficult for founders to be humility, uh, to, to be humble facing that weight. But I think it's it's important for founders to be willing to say, like, I, I just don't know. You know, here's what we're going to try. And I, I I love our team so much. And they've been so incredibly patient because Dave and I are like, we're going to do this and we're going in this direction. It's like, well, you know, we learned that that's not actually working. And so we're going to try this or we're going to switch it up. And they just have to have to be willing to, to change on a dime. Um, and they do. Yeah. But I, I, I can see that there are, you know, or maybe employees that, that are kind of set in their ways or work at much larger companies that are not used to that. And it's it's hard for them. It's hard. I mean, I think the more we try to bring the whole, we have a very small team, by the way, but we still we try to make it very transparent. You know, here is why we're doing this. You know, you know, there's a probability this will happen or this will happen, and we just don't know. And so mm -hmm. we're going to test it. So after the fact, if we learn that didn't work, the, you know, if the team heard it before, heard that there's not, you know. We think there's an eighty percent chance, you know. They understand. Oh, yeah. Well, that was a twenty percent chance that didn't work, and so that's fine. Um, yeah. I think it's important to include the team into those conversations, um, and realize that things will often change, and and that's good. Like learning new things and reacting accordingly is pretty much what you're doing most of the time. Yeah. How often do you get to the end of your day and feel a sense of accomplishment? Mm. Depends on the day. Um, on the good days, uh, I would say uh, two or th two or three times a week on a on a good week. Uh, the the days where I don't sorry, where where I uh, don't necessarily feel that as strongly is when I feel something else like a question that didn't get resolved or. Uh, I was distracted for half the day and didn't get as much done. And um, uh, so, so those, those are kind of like the typical types of emotions at the end of the day. Yeah. Is it ever related to time spent or is it more of like you didn't meet the objective for the day that you set out to meet? <laughs> These are good questions. Um, I think, again, there are times when it's um, – it's, it's both. I would say it's probably more often the latter. It's more like I had these 15 things to do. I thought I would do 12. I only did six today. I see. You know, yeah. um, why? <laughs> um, and then you realize going back to like, there are several houses always on fire. There are several to-do lists that are just growing and growing and growing. <laughs> and so you have to just constantly just like, you yeah. know, uh, 
and you're never going to get to the bottom of them. But um, I think it's just a it's like a constant sorting process. So I mean, what's the key then to to find a sense of peace? Now, I mean, I've this is coming from a person that's just like beat himself to death over this. Like I, I'm I'm finally getting to the place where I can I generally have peace at the end of my day. But oh my gosh, it's taken years to to get to that point. Like, what does it take yeah. for you to to go home, or if you, I guess I don't know if you work from home, but to to yeah. finish your work and then feel that sense of peace? Like you know what I did good today. Like I, it was a productive day, and we're gonna you know yeah. wake up and do it again tomorrow. It's a really good one. Uh, it's, I'd say it easily goes in the very personal category, which, uh, which yeah. I think it has to, um, I, you know, for me at a high level, it's, uh, you know, things like meditation, things mm -hmm. like therapy, things like exercise. Um, I, for me, it's, it's almost like you're, you know, we are this, um, uh, what's a good analogy. We're like a steamship, right? And um, every day it needs to go out and make progress. But if the underlying boat is not sound, if the engine is not running at, at full bore, um, if uh, you know it's not going in the right direction, it, it's gonna be a struggle each day. And so for me, it's like, there's a foundational sense of purpose, of clarity, of um, um, sort of uh, peace, if you will, um, that, you know, ideally is kind of where the day starts and where the day ends. Um, but getting to that point involved a ton of therapy, ton of meditation. I meditate every day, I, you know, journal every day. Um, all the sort of practicing a gratitude mindset. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important because to your point, if you get lost in the day to day and you beat yourself up, you're not going to be able to more easily get back up the next day and go 120%. Yeah. Yeah, because you at least me will stay in that mindset, and so you can't. And I've been through, you know, I've I've, I've been through a lot of mental health um, struggles myself, and and now I realize that it's just it's as important as physical health. It's not yeah, more important. Totally. Yeah. You know. You, you know, man. I, <laughs> therapists are like what half of the the price of an engineer. It's like, why don't we just hire therapists on our team? Like that should be that should well, be a great hire for anybody to speak with uh, on the team. That's another, going back to the whole question or the the discussion about new companies. I think that the whole mental health space is just going through this amazing renaissance, and it's needed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, step one was normalizing, uh, discussing mental health, and making making that a part of the conversation in the workplace, which is kind of happening. Mm -hmm. um, and step two is is bringing more services to the market that maybe is a perk for early stage startups where you can get, you know, you can partner with whatever, whatever therapy provider. It's so important along with coaching, yeah. by the way, coaching for, um, coaching in general, you know, pro, uh, executive coaching or even like leadership coaching it's really, really underappreciated. Um, yeah, mostly great. because it's expensive and, and, but it's so, it's so helpful. Yeah, absolutely. What do you, I, so I, I've worked with my therapist on, um, like what's the word for it? Wrong ways of thinking basically, or thinking mm -hmm. errors, things like black mm -hmm. and white thinking. Yeah. I mean, what, what do you get that's the most value valuable out of therapy that you apply to your professional life? Ooh, <laughs> um, let's see it. That's a, um, well, I think there's a lot of cognitive, uh, bias, um, okay. like, like that, that you're mentioning where, um, you, uh, you know, uh, the human brain is conditioned to be pessimistic. That's the way that we survived um, evolutionarily. And so we have a pessimistic lens on everything that we do. You know, if you taste something and it doesn't like taste like you thought it would taste, you're like, Ugh, what is that? It's just yeah. instinctual. And so, uh, you know, I think if you internalize that, um, you realize that you're going to be harder on yourself uh, than maybe a friend would be on you. Totally. Um, and having even just having that as a framework to think about is, is very helpful. Um, and it also, it, it makes you realize that, you know, if you let that pessimism, that pessimism run free, it will run and it will keep running. Uh, so that, 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 that was like one, um, one really good sort of lesson. I think another one was about all about like this 
body mind connection uh when your body feels good you feel good and vice versa mm -hmm. uh, at, a, at a very very high level and so yeah. sleep for instance i used to you know stay up late and wake up late and i go to I, and it was so destructive now i go to bed at the same time every day wake up same time every day it's been transformational um and it's it's very simple you know it's very simple stuff take take care of your sleep you know take care yeah. of your diet all this stuff is just so important yeah absolutely hmm. that's good stuff i i really would love to see more founders and people in general in, embracing their mental health and just yeah. really focusing on that i think it's just so undervalued and so so important so important it's it's absolutely i mean it's something that i you know um yeah i i i, I if you i i'm optimistic again I'm generally optimistic, but in this in particular, I'm also optimistic because I feel like, again, looking at younger generations, uh, it's now okay to talk about anxiety uh, in college. Um, you know, 15 years ago it was maybe like not as normal, and so I think the conversation space is widening for for this topic, which is good. Yeah. Absolutely. And on the topic of, of meditation, we have a, a viewer question and she asked, uh, you mentioned meditation. What types of meditation do you practice? And I, I'm curious about that too. So I'm glad you, glad you asked. Yeah. It's funny. I was just talking with a good friend last night who's, uh, who lives in Bali and he's been doing this, uh, hour long meditation every day. And he said, oh. he's now on day 37 and he's like, mm. I, I feel like a new person. Uh, huh. I don't do that. Um, I've tried so many different types of meditation. I've tried so many different apps. Um, I found myself going back because I because when I wake, I do it the first thing in the morning. When I wake up first thing in the morning, the last thing I want to do is like go find a meditation to do. Yeah. I literally want. I I prefer to just like press a button, you know. And so the what I've done is I I I have one meditation, same one every day. It's like fifteen minutes long. And it's it's on Insight Timer, which is a which is a free meditation app, and so it doesn't cost any money. But I just make it reduce the number of steps and just press play. Yeah. that's what I do. What's the point though? Like, what do you what do you get out of it? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I know yeah. there's like mindful med mindfulness meditation. There's transcendental meditation. There's lots of versions. But what's the end result for you, or, or what's the end result you're looking for? Yeah, it's a, that's that's a that's the reason why it's so hard is because the end result is sometimes very elusive. It's mm. sometimes you, sometimes you don't, it's, it's almost impossible. It's almost like, um, watching yourself, uh, maybe age over the course of five or 10 years. You, it's almost impossible. You only have to, you have to see a friend every two years and see, and he, he or she could see the progress in a similar way with meditation. You, it's kind of hard to pinpoint, but if, if it is one thing, it's the ability for your mind to kind of like quiet and, and relax. Um, and it's, and it's, uh, I think it's natural for the mind to think and do and think and mm -hmm. do. And, uh, when you're able to kind of quiet the mind and relax the mind, it helps you, you know, think cl more clearly. Uh, yeah. but again, it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's, very hard to notice, but it's there. Do you ever do that in your middle, in the middle of your day? Like I, at my previous office, I had this like awesomely comfortable leather couch in the office. And I, I think this is valuable, but I really suck at doing it. But I, for a short time, I got in the habit of just pausing during my day, turning off all distractions, going into another room, sitting on that couch and just thinking. And at first it felt so unproductive. Um, but I think about guys like, you know, Warren Buffett, you know, he's obviously an outlier, but I mean, he apparently spends hours and hours reading and just thinking. And it's like the, the number of actions he actually takes are relatively small, but they're just super meaningful. It's like, do you, do you find yourself doing that during the day? Uh, so, I mean, I wish I, I, what I try to do is I, 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 I love reading and I, and I, and I, my brain works best when I'm thinking and reading and one thing. I hate, you know, skimming Twitter and like looking at all, I like, I, I really don't like to, to just like constantly be bombarded by different information mm -hmm. sources. Um, there's a book all about this that came out about five years ago called, I believe it's called The Shallows. And okay. um, 
is that what it's called? I believe it's something like that. But it, it, the author's point is really amazing is that like the way that we consume media now, especially in this feed based world is uh, antithetical to the way that our mind works in order to make deep connections, in order to really internalize things, you have to spend time thinking ideally about, mm -hmm. you know, one book or one topic and sort of reason your way through it. So I try, I try to do that more. So I, I try to set aside an hour in the morning for reading ideally books. Um, okay. um, so that, that's the way, cause I, cause otherwise I get caught in this, like I can just constantly, it's no, it's also so natural today because we're just, just bombarded constantly with, yeah emails and text and like everything yeah. so I, I i think that that products are not going to slow down in their sort of desire to sort of capture your attention and so uh, you ha at least for me i have to find ways to like psh, i don't have notifications on my phone for instance mm, um nice. like so like yeah so that it's, and these little things i think just help me stay sane what, what do you think you would be doing now for a career if you were born in 1850? Whew, uh, Speaking of technology. Well, yeah, I probably would be working in a factory or something. 18, <laughs> wait, 1860? Yes, yeah, oh, so I, I, I come from, you pick. I come from, I come from a, like a very normal, like working class family. Mm -hmm. Like I was the first person in my family to, um, to go to graduate school. Like most of my okay. extended family, a lot of them like didn't go to college. And so um, I would probably be like a worker, you know, I'd probably be um, like a factory worker um, of some kind. Yeah. I, um, this sounds probably really ungrateful and maybe it is, but I kind of, I'm kind of jealous of that time in a way, like and specifically I'm thinking, I, I don't mean like backbreaking labor. Like I'm truly grateful for the opportunity to make a living, you know, just standing here in my office, like it's wonderful. But what I'm jealous of is, the lack of distractions, the the ability to deeper focus. I just imagine myself, you know, sitting in my study in my leather chair, you know, smoking a pipe, reading a good book. You know, it's like that uh, it, next to the fire, right? Like that that sort of lifestyle sounds amazing to me. And it's just a slower pace of life and, and a deeper, I don't know, place of being. Yeah, yeah. There definitely are um, some drawbacks to the information age. Um, we don't have shared experiences anymore. You know, we, we used to watch all the same three TV shows, you know, 50 years ago, watch yeah, the same movies every week, mm -hmm. um, and read the same books. You know, everyone is kind of yeah. in their own little content bubble. Um, yeah. sports is sports and politics are the, are the two things that, um, end up sort of focusing a lot of attention usually. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Patrick, we're going to, I guess start the process of landing this plane, but I do, I do have a, a question that I wanted to ask you. Um, let me ask it and I'll kind of, I'll, I'll lay some groundwork for it, but, um, or explain this, I should say. So if, if right now you were reset to zero, so you had no money, no connections, et cetera, I'm curious how you would restart, restart, you know, what, what, what you would do and why. And the essence of what I'm getting at is like the core elements of success. Think like somebody listening that's, newer in the journey or at the, the beginning places of this journey. Um, so if you were to reverse, reverse engineer, take your, your wisdom and experience, like how would that look for you? So I knew, I, assuming I, I know nothing about business or network. I don't have a network. I don't have like a basic skill set. Right. You have your, your wisdom. Um, yeah. And, ex and experience, but not, not any connections, no, no money to sort of, you know, go back to college or whatever. I'm just curious what will you, what you would do. Interesting. Um, that's a good one. Assuming I lived in the United States in the modern era. That's a good point. Yep. Yep. Um, and I had like access to the internet. Sure. Okay. So he, actually I'll, I'll, uh, this is something that I actually advise kids and uh, some, some of the students I teach in college at the, at USC, um, for, for what they should be, what they could do over the summers. Let's say what I would do is I would find a way to, build my skills uh, in a certain uh, category, even if I don't have any skills, um, and do something such that the uh, the iteration loop uh, between, let's say, doing a thing and then learning and then maybe getting paid for it is, is as tight as possible. So I could kind of get better and better. Um, so what that means in practice is I would 
go to one of these online marketplaces like Upwork or um, there's now tons of them where you yeah. can essentially and 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 I would focus on one specific one specific task. Maybe I'll do a copywriting thing. Maybe I'll uh, proofread something. Um, and I would I would basically try to build up a set of a set of expertise in that mm -hmm. one narrow thing. Um, get paid for it at a small amount, and then like slowly increase. Uh, so basically, get hands-on experience as quickly as possible, which you can do now. Um, when yeah. I was in college, there wasn't you know it was it was very hard to find paid kind of jobs like this. Uh, but, but now there are lots of them. Yeah. It's good. What, what's next for you? Let's, let's end with that. Like what, where do you see your life being in five to 10 years? I mean, if you had control over the future, where would you, where would you like to be? Uh, well, if the, we believe at commons that what we're building is a 15 year vision at least, mm -hmm. and it really revolves around revolutionizing enterprise collaboration via voice. And so ideally, we're still trying to build towards that vision in five, 10 years. And, and in five, 10 years, I think that vision will be even bigger uh, in terms of scale. Um, but in general, uh, having now done the zero to one experience mm -hmm. um, and previously working in product um, and doing like, I guess, more one to end, I would uh, I would do this again any day. I would start a company again um, as uh, as much as 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 I can, essentially. Yeah, you know what's so neat about I I, I often compare the evolution of a company to to raising children, and each stage is so much fun, and there's so much joy in each one. But I don't want to stay in each one forever. Like two year olds are really cute, but. I'm ready for them to grow up as well. Like, like each stage is just so wonderful. And I think it's very similar for business, you know, startups are so, fun, but stressful, you know, house is always on fire. And I, I think there's uh there's stages in the future to look forward to and to, to embrace once we get there. A thousand. I complete, I don't have kids, but um, I, I understand exactly what you're, because I, I think of the same way, like working at a company is kind of like babysitting, you know, you're working for a different company. When you start a company, it's more like, oh wow, like I got to take care of this thing. Like this, this is my baby. This, this is mine. Like this is gonna yeah. like this. This is like this is like a full time job, <laughs> yeah, and it's, yes. it's like a it's like a mental shift um, yeah. that I think is very fulfilling for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Patrick, we could keep going probably literally for weeks. Um, I really appreciate <laughs> your time. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you hope that we would? Uh, well, I wish my co-founders could have been here because they have an amazing background and a lot of incredible experiences and, and, and obviously a very different perspective on, on what we're doing at Commons. Um, I always love talking more about Commons, but we can we can say, say that for the next time. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would love to have them if they're interested in being on the, on the show after watching this. Uh, and I don't know if they will be or not, but if they are, I'd love to have them. So please, That'd be great. please, please pass along that invite. Uh, and then lastly, if anybody wants to get in touch with, touch with you, which, what's the, uh, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, it's, uh, so the website is commons.so and my email is patrick at commons.so. Uh, okay, great. And then would so, Twitter be also, an, 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 I'm sorry, Twitter. Um, say LinkedIn. LinkedIn is great. Um, Perfect. Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks again, Patrick. You've been really gracious with your time and we certainly appreciate of course. it. Really enjoyed it. Thanks so much, Jim. All right. Cheers. See ya.